The new movie, Salmon Fishing in the Yemen, is about a fisheries biologist played by Ewan McGregor, who reluctantly helps a sheikh introduce salmon to the desert. Emily Blunt plays the sheikh's consultant, who helps realize this vision and is the romantic interest of Ewan McGregor. Our guest today is Mike Kinnison. Mike is Associate Professor of Evolutionary Applications in the University of Maine School of Biology and Ecology. Thank you so much for joining us, Mike. Uh, my pleasure. What would you have told the filmmakers if they'd asked you about introducing salmon to Yemen? Uh, I would probably say much the same thing as, as the protagonist of the film. It seems like a pretty absurd idea in general. At least that, that would be probably my initial response is that seems pretty, pretty far-fetched. But people have you know, undertaken bigger efforts in some cases to introduce species into strange places. So, you know, I, I'd probably say that initially, and then I'd probably be going home scratching my head about, you know, what, what would really be involved. What would really be involved? Well, uh, the Yemen has no year-round flowing rivers. So for an animal like salmon, uh, that's a real challenge. And if any water even made it to the ocean, it's a tropical ocean where, again, salmon don't do too well. So it's not like they can really get out of the rivers too easily. So all I can imagine would be required would be to not just introduce salmon into a river, but to create a brand new river. <laughs> and basically create a whole ecosystem, whole cloth. Why aren't there more projects like in the movie, in, in real life right now? Because it sounds right. kind of great, you know? Like, I want to fish for salmon. I'm going to bring them in here to my, you know, local pond. Why not? Right. It's a, there's very much more a precautionary approach to this today than there used to be. Yeah. Uh, so with regards to a movie like this, you know, I, I what kind of get, initially, again, I thought this is sort of an absurd thing to do this sort of, big introduction at that sort of scale. Mm -hmm. And that was my instinctual precautionary, you know, first feasibility, it doesn't seem realistic. Then after that, mm -hmm. the precautionary part comes in where you're like, well, what would be the effects? What would be the downside of that? And, mm -hmm. you know, having spent so much time as I have reading about introductions and invasions and their consequences, you know, I always have this little pit here, you know, in my stomach going, what would be the downside of that? And then the kind of the flip around that came at the end of all of that is in this case, uh, in that sort of situation, you've created an environment so far away, so far removed, it, it's almost like talking about terraforming on Mars. Wow. You know, wow. <laughs> you know what, is, what is going to be the consequence for Mars if we bring a pine tree there? I mean, it, it could be pretty dramatic, but most likely your pine tree is just going to die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right. Firstly, we would need to trap 10,000 salmon, get them to the Yemen alive, don't ask me how, allowing the salmon to migrate upstream, of course, until the dry season, when they will all die. It's very impressive, Dr. Jones. So the, the movie opens in theaters on March 9th, so we don't know yet whether they establish salmon in Yemen in the movie. Closer to home. They do. <laughs> Closer I don't know. The final scene, which looked like a dam breaching and this giant flow of water coming down. So. Ah. I mean, there, there, there might be some some unintended effect at the end of the movie. I think we've both studied the trailer a lot. <laughs> so, in in real life, you study several species that are listed under the Endangered Species Act, including the Atlantic salmon, short-nosed sturgeon, and the Atlantic sturgeon. How do you think we can help these species to recover? Well, for the most part, helping species is, to recover uh, is often, at least in their native range, a story about finding out what habitat is most critical to their needs. So for things like salmon and these uh, sturgeon, uh, part of that critical habitat are these migratory routes that they end up taking. In salmon... Uh, for Atlantic salmon, opening up that migratory path. So right now here in Maine, there's a very large project that has federal, non-governmental, and uh, local state backing and so on that's going to work to try and remove several dams out of the Penobscot River. And the idea there is that that's a major step forward in allowing those salmon to be able to access their critical habitat, which is spawning habitat upriver, 
and then in turn allow juveniles that are migrating downriver the access through that critical habitat to get to the ocean. For sturgeon, the critical habitat question is a bit harder because they don't tend to often travel to the kind of very visible, easily monitorable locations that we see for salmon. Sturgeon often live in very deep estuarine type waters, or even when they move up in freshwater, they kind of tend to stay in sort of hidden, deeper locations. And so they are, uh, there's a lot more work to, going on just to try and figure out what is their critical habitat. How are you monitoring sturgeon? So for, for sturgeon, because they're hard to visually see and track and follow around, uh, what we do is we put uh, uh, ultrasonic telemetry gear in them. What it basically is, is it's a little device that you can surgically implant in the fish that sends off a code an at an ultrasonic level. And that code uh, can be picked up by receivers that we place around the river that listen for these fish to go past. And so we can then, we then know their movement patterns. We, we catch them in a couple locations where we can find them pretty well, take them out of the water, implant these tags, and then we can follow those fish around and start to get an idea of if they're spending a lot of time in this place, maybe this is a pretty important location for them. Mm-hmm. Inserting mm-hmm. monitors into fish and then monitoring them underground. I mean, it sounds kind of sci-fi. Uh, another thing that we proposed working with for some of our fish around here is to use these uh, remote gliders, which don't fly over the ocean, but fly under the ocean. These are little submersible wow. vehicles that are entirely autonomous robots on their own. They, you program a route for them to travel And once you program this route, they head out to sea and travel back and forth and measure whatever you want, depending on what's attached to that that particular glider. And we can put things like receivers on these gliders, and then these these gliders go out to sea and cruise around looking for the fish for us, trying to find those tags. So if there were going to be a movie made about you... Would it be a sci-fi movie? I don't know about that. (laughs) Who would play you? Well, Lou McGregor's already been taken, so I'm going to have to say George Clooney, maybe. I can see the resemblance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's great. Great. <laughs> great. Well, thank you very much. This has been fascinating. My pleasure. Blast, that's why I hate flying.